Hi, I'm Magdalena Bielopolska, the Director of Experience at Cooth. Hello, my name is JF Hector Labrum, and I'm the Principal Front End Engineer at Cooth. We work for Cooth, which is the UK's largest digital mental health and wellbeing platform, supporting children, young people, and adults. We provide online counseling services, psychoeducational content, as well as giving a space for people to interact in our online communities and share their experiences about mental well-being. Today, we're going to talk to you about how understanding accessibility makes you a better developer, designer, leader, person in general. Accessibility, inclusive design, and disability. These are all really complex issues. And I'm sure a lot of you out there know more about accessibility than we do. But today we're going to tell you how we talk about accessibility at Cooth and how we make it happen. There are other ways to talk about accessibility that are just as good or maybe even better in different situations. But for our context, this is how we approach it. So before we get into the details of how we work at Cooth, I wanted to take a moment to step back and take a look at the impact of disability uh, in the UK. So right now, almost 13 million people are living with a permanent disability. 5.7 million people in the UK have a temporary, temporary disability and 70% of disabilities are invisible. It's really important to be aware of how many people are actually impacted by this when we talk about accessibility and the work that we do. To simplify things, we can understand impairments from three different perspectives, permanent, temporary, and situational. In this example, we can see how similar functionality can be impaired by different circumstances. You may not consider yourself as someone with a disability, but this illustration demonstrates how we can all be impaired at times. As mentioned earlier, 70% of impairments are invisible. Quite often when people talk about accessibility, they talk about impairments that we can see, like in the previous slide. In the context of digital platforms, each of these circumstances, dyslexia, lack of sleep, dealing with loss, can impact someone's experience and journey in different ways. These invisible impairments are something we spend a lot of time trying to understand at Cooth. Because of the nature of our service, people are coming to us in a variety of different mental states. For example, they may be in distress, at the point of a panic attack, or living with a depression. So we need to consider how the experience supports or hinders their individual journey. So just to take a moment to consider the visual experience, we would think about the language we're using. Is it triggering or overcomplicated? Is it welcoming and approachable? Are the colors jarring? Could they increase the state of anxiety? Or are they soothing and calming? When someone signs up to our service, is the journey arduous and complex? Or is it clear, transparent, and helps build trust? These are the kinds of things we consider and test when we are building our experiences. One thing that is clear is that when you decide, design to be inclusive and consider a variety of needs, then ultimately everyone benefits from it. One thing we've learned is that to make accessibility happen, first, we need to start clarifying what it is that we mean when we use the word accessibility. A lot of people use the word accessibility, but often they mean quite different things. So when you use the word accessibility, your idea of what it means might be quite different from um, the idea that the other person has. So first, I want to clarify what it is that we actually mean in this presentation when we use the word accessibility. There are three parts to this presentation. First, we're going to talk about what you need to commit to achieving. Second, we're going to talk about how you will achieve it. And third, we're going to talk about why achieving that is important. When we use the word accessibility, what people often think we mean is that every single person on the planet finds using a website easy, regardless of any impairment they might have. And then they sometimes think, 
wow, that required designing and building lots of additional features to compensate for different people's disabilities. And then they sometimes think, well, if we need to design and build lots of additional features, that will probably take a lot of time. We should probably add those features later, not now. And then they sometimes think, doing that would be remarkable. It'd be quite extraordinary. It'd be a compassionate thing to do. It'd be a charitable thing to do. But ultimately, they may think, doing that is not our priority. It might not even be our responsibility. That way of thinking of accessibility is not what Magdalena and I mean when we use the word accessibility. So here's what we actually mean when we use the word accessibility. When we ask our team to make sure that our websites are accessible, we are not asking them to make sure that every single person on the planet finds the website really super easy to use. We'd like for that to be the case, but we feel that we need to ask our colleagues to do something that's a lot more specific and also easier to achieve. So what we ask them to do is to make sure that our websites work with the accessibility features that are already included in the operating systems and the web browsers that people have. And we're also asking them to meet a standard called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines Level AA at a minimum. And we're asking our team to also be careful not to do anything that would unnecessarily exclude people. Now, doing that is mostly not about doing additional work. Instead, it's mostly about improving our design practices, improving our coding practices, and improving our, our testing quality assurance practices. And for sure, learning to do this as a team takes time at the beginning. But then, once you've learned those more inclusive practices, it generally takes only five to 10% extra time to follow those practices. But that's assuming that we really are proactive about inclusion as we design, and as we build the websites. If we don't, if we're not careful as we go, if we let accessibility issues enter our designer code and then you know, say, oh, we'll fix them later, then fixing those issues later is 40 to 100 times more time consuming and expensive. And achieving this is not actually remarkable. It should be ordinary. It needs to have nothing to deal with compassion. I'd say it has nothing to deal at all with being charitable. Instead, it's a key part of creating a quality service for millions of people. And lastly, being careful not to unnecessarily exclude people is absolutely our responsibility. Well, that's it. That's everything we wanted to tell you today. Now, what we're going to do is look at some of those things that we've just said in more details and add some examples. Let's start by looking in more detail at the what, what you need to commit to achieving. First, Accessibility means supporting built-in accessibility features and meeting the web content accessibility guidelines level AA at a minimum. It turns out that operating systems like Windows or Mac OS and also web browsers like Google Chrome or Firefox already have all the accessibility features that we need. So for example, Users have access to screen readers that give a, a, a nodio structural representation of what's on a web page and how to interact with it. Um, people can pinch to zoom on a, on a web page on, on touch screens. Or if you more of a kind of laptop user, you can make everything on a page on a web page get bigger. Uh, you can if, you know, if a web page is coded well and designed well, you can do everything using just the keyboard without using a mouse or your finger. 
And as you do this, um, it should be very, very clear and obvious where which, which element on the page, as you select it with the keyboard, which one is selected and you can then activate pressing enter. That all like comes out of the box unless we kind of disable those things. And so our role is not about designing and building accessibility features ourselves. Instead, our role is to make sure that websites work with accessibility features that people already have. So for example, when you write HTML, if you type button in angle brackets like this, this, um, this little bit of code will create a fully accessible button. With just this bit of code, you've created a button that you can reach by moving your mouse to it, by pressing tab with the keyboard until you reach it, by maybe hearing it in list of buttons on the page, by saying show numbers, if you use something like voice control and, and then selecting the number under the uh, above the button, um, you know that you've reached it because uh, there is an outline around it. Um, the screener will say that you reach the button. It will say button and will tell you the name of the button. And you can activate it by clicking it, pressing enter, pressing space, uh, or saying click and the name of the button. However, if you write the word span instead of button, that creates something that can look like a button, but it only works for some people. So you may be, you may be able to, to click the span if you're a mouse user or, or a touchscreen user, but you can't activate it with your keyboard. You can't use it with a screen reader. You can't activate it with your voice. Um, and I'm sure you'll agree that using the word button in HTML instead of the word span doesn't, doesn't really take longer to code. And today, it used to be different, but today styling a real button is just as easy as styling a fake button. Um, so it really doesn't take longer, but it really ensures that we're not unnecessarily excluding people. Now, you think that's obvious, um, but actually, if you look at even major websites, you'd see that a lot of them use span instead of button. And, and the examples you see on these slides here are just um, a few, it's just a few examples I could find within an hour on some very, very big websites. And the example I gave about button, that's just one of the many, many ways in which we can exclude people unnecessarily and even without knowing that we are. So to help us avoid unnecessarily excluding people, we use the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They are an international standard, and at CUT, we, we committed to meeting that standard at a minimum. And the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines is essentially a long list of mistakes to avoid. And reading through these guidelines is, is really one of the most useful things that you could do. But they're also quite long, and it's a very daunting document uh, if you're a beginner. So we've written a simplified summary of those guidelines um, that a lot of people are finding useful. So I'd like to show you some of the mistakes that accessibility guidelines will help you avoid. First, I'm gonna play an animation here for a few seconds. Don't animate anything automatically for more than five seconds, unless people can easily stop it. So this is a recording of a website um, and that, anim that animation on my slide just stopped because my video stopped. But that animation of the, the, neon, the neon flashing on and off would continue continuously. Don't do that because it's, it's really distracting. And uh, so personally, when there's a, a website like this and I'm really struggling to focus on any information I need to read next to it or any information I need to any form I need to type in next to it. Next, don't indicate errors using color alone. So this is an example of uh, T's and C's on a website. And I had forgotten to, to take some mandatory checkboxes and I press submit. So it's telling me that there are some required 
checkbox is in red below. And yes, they are marked in red. And I happen to find it easy to see the difference between red and gray. But if you had protanopia, then the, the, it'd be very, very hard to see um, what's in red and what's in black or gray. So don't indicate colors. Don't indicate errors using color item. Next, don't hide the keyboard focus indicator for keyboard users. So I mentioned earlier that on a well-coded website and a well-designed website, you can do everything using just the keyboard. The way you do this is you press the tab key several times and it reaches every single interactive element on the screen. And to know which element is um, selected, um, by default, there is um, a focus outline that the browsers provide for you for free. This one on the slide is pink because I personally like them pink, but by default, they are blue or black and white, and they're always here for free, unless you decide as a designer or developer or client to ask someone to disable them. And so if you do that bit of code here, then suddenly keyboard users cannot use your website anymore. And there's never a good reason to do this. There is a, there is a way to disable these outlines just for mouse users and not for keyboard users with a new CSS property that's called focus visible. So you need to commit with your team to support the accessibility features that are built into web browsers and operating systems and to meet the web content accessibility guidelines. But on top of that, you also need to be careful not to unnecessarily exclude people. So the web content accessibility guidelines are great, but they aren't exhaustive. And there are some things that sit outside of their remit that are really helpful for you to keep in mind when you're designing or building any experience. So for example, there are best practices out there. A lot of work has been done in the inclusive design space. So go and seek those um, examples out and see whether they, it makes sense to incorporate them into your work. Number two is probably, if not the most important part, design with people who experience and interact with user interfaces differently than you do, or at least act on feedback that you may get, whether that's through somebody else or feedback on your site or something like that. But the best way to know whether people can access your, your website or service is by getting that real life feedback. And thirdly, um, which is very related to the first point, is use familiar inclusively tested, um, inclusively tested design patterns. If you don't have the time to run your own testing, then see what's been tested out there and see whether it works for you. And right now I wanna share, uh, share a real life example with something that happened with us recently. So we, we offer a chat uh, and messaging service on our platform where a service user can speak directly to a practitioner and have a, a therapeutic session. So on the left-hand side, you can see our original UI. And even I'm struggling to see um, with the contrast um, like contrast issues that are happening here with that teal green and the white. So based on our knowledge and uh, some ideas we had around improving this experience, we sort of iterated on the original to create this safe to try experience. And here you can see there are some differences in terms of the color that we're using, some of the language. Um, up on the top, we have a clear out button, sort of exit button, the back to Couth. There's a bit of context of who you're chatting with. And then obviously the UI elements themselves with the, the text but buttons, um, the bubbles are a different color here. So this was a really sort of safe to try option. We felt uh, that we had good knowledge in putting this in front of users and we didn't have the time to test it. Uh, the, one, the other thing I want to add just at the bottom is a, a really clear send button, um, which previously didn't exist. So that could have put, posed some challenges, especially for screen reader users. So we pu pushed this out live into the world and really quickly, we actually got some feedback from a user. And this feedback came from one of our practitioners who was in a one-to-one -one chat with them. And the feedback there was actually that blue and the white was too high contrast. Um, and they found it really difficult to, to read um, and it was disorienting to spend an hour long session uh, 
with this high contrast. And what's interesting, back to the, the web content accessibility guidelines, is that there is a minimum contrast ratio that they recommend, but there's no maximum. This is a thought that we never really considered is like, oh, it, it, the contrast can be too high as well as too low. Um, so what we did is actually take that feedback and we managed to turn around quite quickly to uh, change the, the contrast ratio of that blue. And as you can see, it's been toned down a little bit. But there was a bit of an example of using real world, world feedback to uh, to improve our designs. Now, we still have a lot of work to do. And large portions of Kuth do not yet meet those standards. However, over the past year and a half, everything that we have built, everything that we have designed has either met that standard or been very, very close to, to meeting those standards. We're learning this way of working as a team very fast. So now I want to show you some of the examples of how we've been designing and building our websites in ways that are more inclusive. This first demo shows you what it's like to sign into Kuth at 400% zoom using just the keyboard. So as you increase the magnification on screen, all the content reflows and it's all in one column and, and you can access everything. Um, and then when you press the tab key, you access you know, the uh, lo login modal and everything's just doable with a keyboard um, with high level of magnific magnification. This second demo shows you what it's like for one of our counselors to send a message to a service user using just the keyboard and a screen reader. You'll notice that there are parts of that page that have very clear accessibility issues. And this is one of the examples where we still need to improve quite a bit. New message. Button. Write your message below. Edit text. <laughs> Cancel. Preview message. Button. Heading level three, two items. Confirm your message to Evangelos Descouth. Heading level four. Your message. Thanks for your message. Please tell me more. Admin. Selected. Radio button. One of two. Message type. Net therapeutic. Selected. Back. Send message. Button. Your notification, region. Your message has been sent. You are currently on a region. And this third demo shows you what it's like to browse the site using just your voice. Scroll down, tap go to mini activities. Scroll down, scroll down, tap view activity, share advice with others. Scroll down. Scroll down, pan up, tap I've tried this activity. Scroll down, tap view comments. So we've talked about what you need to commit to achieving as a team. Now let's talk about how you will achieve this. As we've just demonstrated, it's mostly not about designing and building additional features. And it does not need to take significantly more time. Instead, it's about improving your practices, improving your design practices or coding practices or testing practices. And yes, learning to do that as a team takes time at the beginning. But you might be wondering, why do we need time to learn that? Don't, don't we know how to do that already? Well, most accessibility barriers might not affect you personally. So you might not even realize that they are in your designs or in your code. Let's look at an example. This is a tweet by a Canadian accessibility specialist called Nicholas Stinhout, who is also a wheelchair user. And he's posting a picture of, um, of a bathroom in a hotel. And he's asking, so, so this, this bathroom was advertised as being accessible. And Nicholas is asking, this is another, you know, this is another bathroom that advertises itself as being accessible and it fails at that. Can you guess what some of the accessibility issues are with this bathroom? 
I'll give you I'll give you a, a few seconds to think about it. So the first issue that Nicola flagged is that the shower head is left all the way at the top of the rail. So reaching it from a real chair could be quite dangerous and it's difficult. The other issue is that the grab bars are not positioned in a way where they're useful. Uh, they, don't, they don't actually help you transfer to the bench. And the third issue is that the bench is, is, is made of polished stone. So once that's wet, it's very, very slippery. Now, I find that really interesting. Um, you know, I think about inclusive design a lot, but I'm not, I, I'm not a wheelchair user. And I don't know about you, but I tried to guess what the issues were on that picture, but I had no idea. And that's why it's so important that we design with people who are affected by our designs not just for them. So it's about learning to make our practices more inclusive, whatever our job title. And yes, it takes time to learn to do that as a team. But once you've learned those inclusive practices, it only takes about five or 10% extra time to follow them on average. So it really doesn't take that much more time to do things inclusively. But that's only true if we're careful to be inclusive as we design and as we code from the beginning of the process. Because once we've introduced an accessibility issue, fixing that issue at a late date after we've released the software can be 40 to 100 times more time consuming and expensive. And that's because accessibility is not a separate feature. You, you cannot successfully add accessibility at the end. It, so in that sense, it does not work like icing on a cake. Instead, accessibility is a set of considerations that need to be baked in right from the start of the design and the coding process. So in that sense, accessibility is more like eggs in a cake if you don't add them at the beginning, you'll really struggle to make things okay later. To help us with this, we've been building an inclusive design system. It's a set of user interface components that are fully accessible. And whenever we need to design or build a new page, we use those components and it takes care of a big part of the job. Now let's talk about why achieving that is important. Doing that is not remarkable. It's not extraordinary. Instead, it's a key part of creating a quality service for millions of people. And importantly, it's our responsibility as designers, developers, and product people. So ways of thinking about disability are evolving. Here we have two perspectives around um, disability. On the left hand side is this me the medical model, which is a little bit archaic now. And it looks at people as being disabled um, by their impairments or differences. So if we were talking about our website through this perspective, we might say someone is struggling to use, use our site because of their impairment. While on the right hand side, we look at the social model, where people are disabled by barriers in society. So if we, again, look, through our, look at our website through this perspective, we might say someone is struggling to use our site because of us and because we haven't built it using good accessibility practices. And this ties in really nicely with um, the World Health Organization and how they've evolved their definition of disability over the last 30 years. You can see on the left-hand side, it really mirrors that medical model we looked at earlier. But most recently, in 2011, they've updated this to talk about disability as a complex phenomenon, reflecting on the interaction between features of a person's body and the features in society. So just to pause there for a moment, once you start learning about accessibility, you'll keep expanding and building your knowledge on it. And you'll start seeing it everywhere. You'll start seeing it to the, the usual websites you used to go to. You'll start seeing it in the physical environment around you. 
And all of this information, this new information is going to uh, inform the work that you do moving forward. I believe that accessibility barriers don't happen because of a lack of time or a lack of budget. They appear when the people making decisions, design decisions, coding decisions, product decisions, when people make decisions are not going to be affected by the lack of accessibility in, in, in the output. So as people who build the digital environment, it, it is our responsibility to make sure that everything that we do really has inclusivity in mind. The good news is, you know, this can seem daunting, but the good news is as soon as you start learning, every time that you spend an hour and learn one more thing, you can't unlearn the things and just starting and you just start to see things differently. And it, it's really interesting as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for being here today.